I've made a, a choice that I think Sarah's the right person and that monogamy is the right idea and that family is a priority over all the other stuff which I also really, 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 really want. Tim Minchin is an Australian comedian, actor, writer, musician, composer, lyricist and director. He's 44, he's married to Sarah Minchin, who's the woman he started dating at uni. And together they have two kids. Tim's best known for a few things, writing the musical Matilda, wearing eyeliner and writing a song about George Pell that the convicted child sex offender didn't much like. And he has a new show called Upright that he's written, directed and stars in. It's a buddy road comedy that explores an unconventional friendship in the most delightful and surprising way. There are all the facts about Tim Minchin that you can find anywhere, really. What's harder to articulate is the charisma he has. Tim is really kind of magnetic, is the best way to describe him. He has such a kind of unique vibe about him that makes you really lean in, whether you're watching him on screen or on stage, and certainly when he's sitting right in front of you. Tim's originally from Perth, but he moved to London and became wildly famous quite a few years ago before he moved to America, where he starred in a TV show and signed some exciting deals. And then after working on his passion project for a number of years, it kind of blew up in his face. In this conversation, he had some really interesting things to say about Hollywood, about fame, monogamy, how to process the idea that your biggest success is behind you, and how that success can bring with it some really unexpected consequences in your personal life. I started our conversation by asking Tim to describe Upright. Here he is. The, the quick answer is it's a comedy drama road trip. You know, yeah. odd couple two-hander is, is slightly curious in tone and packs an emotional punch, um, I suppose. It's sort of more than the sum of its parts, I think, as it turns out. I mean, I, I, I should say I'm unashamedly proud of it, which I can't say about everything I do. Why did you come back to Australia? Always the plan. It's interesting then um, there's a bit of a narrative's come out of this recent round of press that I got battered by America and kind of came home with my tail between my legs. And, I mean, I certainly got battered by America, but how? How did you get battered? Oh, well, we spent four years making an animated film uh, that got shut down when in a corporate takeover. So I was co-directing a $100 oh. million dollar singing animal movie and uh, Universal Pictures bought DreamWorks and just uh, put it in the bin when it was like three quarters finished. How did? What was that phone call like? I was in Budapest filming Robin Hood. It was pretty shocking. I, I knew it was a possibility by then. It had started being talked about it was an interesting time animation is long and hard and you have executives galore telling you that this and that for years testing your commitment and questioning your every decision and a tiny bit of me was so tired that when they finally went we're shutting it down I was like oh my god (laughs) but then it became then I was furious for six months a year do you go through the fury, the grief, the denial, the, yeah. all of the stages? Because it's a massive loss. How do you even process that? It's like it's almost done. Yeah, and it's four years of work and your life and, and 110 other beautiful creatives. There were you know, Harry Cripps who wrote the script who had become a very, very close friend of mine. I mean, he'd been working on it for seven years. This was his thing. This was his opus. And there's a lot of different feelings the, the trouble is I'm also so hyper aware of uh, my privilege and how lucky I've been that I, in that year where I was actually quite depressed because Groundhog Day shut down early and I, I just, I had a, a year where everything went from from being someone who everything I touched turned to gold, everything just turned to shit in a year. So Groundhog Day was a musical you wrote yeah. that was on Broadway. Yeah, that was a massive critical success in London and won the Olivier Award and, and then went to Broadway and got sort of uh, monstered by lots of reasons, ranging from bad luck to maybe the show's a little dark for an American audience to genuine uh, conspiracy by asshole producers. And, you know, like it's America's brutal. Yeah. I mean... America is brutal. Mm. It's it's in their culture. You, the sort of dark underbelly of the American dream is, you fight 
and if you win and get rich, you buy as much stuff as you can. You know, like that's it's all there, you know. As an artist, it's the kind of the pinnacle to be there, isn't it? Not or for is me. It not, not for me. Did you it, think, it though, is. is that why you moved there? Because it was like the natural conclusion after all those years in London. I went there because I thought it was a great project and a, another great adventure, another grand adventure for my family and I. And we did. We had a gorgeous time in LA. We made beautiful friends. We got to live somewhere else. And to come all the way back around to your mm. uh, why did you move home, we were always going to move home. In fact, from before we moved to LA, we had January 2018, kids will be in school in Sydney in January 2018. We're going to move near my sister. My other sister's going to move up from Melbourne. We had a plan. And because we were so embedded in London, we'd been there for eight years, our kids were born there. I said to Sarah, when this LA opportunity came up, when DreamWorks said direct it, I said, we should leave now because this is going to get impossible to leave. We should just tear the Band-Aid off. This is our little window. Let's jump out, have one more grand adventure and then go home. And that was the plan. And then the movie became bigger and bigger and bigger and then got slammed. But we, we did what we were always going to do because I want my kids to grow up near their family and near the beach. Why Sydney, not Perth? I actually love Perth and I think upright in a way is a love letter to Perth. I actually have quite a – if people from Perth go, oh, I couldn't wait to get out of there, bloody well, – I, I get really chippy about that. I don't, I, I don't brook any sort of snobbery about Perth. I love it. It's probably my favourite place in the world. It's where my people are. But it's one thing turning my back on an international career in order to bring my kids up near the beach. It's another to go home to Perth. It, it's a bit hard to do the work I want to do. You know, it's a big, big thing for me coming home because if I'm in London, I can I can work at the National and the RSC and the Old Vic mm, and the Royal Shakespeare Club. Uh, yeah, and I can in it's LA club. not club <laughs> company What's it called company. Yeah. And I, in LA, I can on on Broadway. I can I could write all year yeah. round on Broadway, and in LA, I could I could be on my next film. However, I, and yet I, and yet up, upright's better than anything I've ever made. So I made it here in South Australia and West Australia. I've um, interviewed Elizabeth Gilbert a few times about all, all sorts of projects that she's done and she had that experience that I would say probably echoes yours on Matilda where you have this unexpected, ridiculous success, wilder than, you know, from from not obscurity but like, you know, you're toddling along and then this meteor flies mm. through your life that you're, that you're responsible for. And, I mean, Matilda's won hundreds of international awards, is is so iconic. And and the same thing happened to her with Eat, Pray, Love, culminating in Julia Roberts playing her in a movie. Mm-hmm. And she says she had to get to a point where she had to accept that her best work was probably behind her or her most successful work. I shouldn't yeah. say her best work because yeah. there are things that she's loved a lot more than that book. But I guess her greatest commercial fame success is behind her. Mm-hmm. Tell me about your experience of that, whether that's something that you've kind of wrestled with. Does it worry her? She said it's a massive relief. Yeah. She said it's like she did a book after that and it bombed and she's like, okay, phew, now I can just make work that I love. Very good. Yeah, that's really interesting and and having to deal with a a bomb then then recalibrates everything Exactly. And I – so I always thought – after Matilda did what it did, that I would never make another musical that successful again. And by never make it, I mean I will deliberately never make it. You know, people are like, do you want to write another children's? I'm like, no. My relationship with musical theatre is that I wrote songs for an incredible bunch of creatives who put Matilda together. It was lightning in a bottle. It was a bunch of incredible people working at their absolute peak on a project that we thought was going to be in Stratford for 12 weeks. We, we always knew that we hoped it would go on, but it, we were focused on writing something, making something that we would like to watch and honouring Roald Dahl and making it beautiful. And I have no interest in trying to write hit musicals. Mm. The, the fact that I'm allowed to write musical theatre is incredible and my interest in it is to see what I can do with the genre in my own weird way, in my own slightly not educated, I, I, I'm not an educated composer, I can't read or write sheet music, I, I, I know what I know, I believe what I believe about theatre and storytelling, I care very much about words and I do not care about 
most musicals. How do you write if you can't read or write music? I mean, you just play in all the parts. So I just, I sit at the piano, I write a song, I go to my software, I play in the piano, I put in a vocal, I stick in a bass, I put in some drums. Liz Gilbert talks about, you know, ideas and coming and some people talk about the muse and some people think things come perfectly formed and others just go, right, I'm sitting at my desk, I'm going to work today. The muse might turn up, the muse might turn up, but my job is to sit here. Is that how you look at it or you're just kind of, you have to get in a zone or? No, I mean, I'm a deeply unmystical person. I mean, I'm a (laughs) profoundly. You love a bit of science, don't you? I love a bit of science. It's all bollocks. And actually I've gone on a journey in the last 20 years to divest myself of even the last tiny sniffs of superstition about this stuff. So when I'm about to go on stage in front of thousands of people, there's no meditation. There's no, no moment. Ritual. I don't, I don't have to get in a moment. I'd, I just walk out of my change room, I high five my sound guy, you know, have a shot of tequila if I'm feeling a bit slow and walk on stage and do my job. And the same with writing. There's no hat or special piano. I wrote Groundhog Day in a windowless dressing room. I, I care very much about taking all the magic away because mm. you, you keep attributing your work to other forces and it's it, all that can do is disempower you. Really, I feel that strongly. I, I can do what I do to the extent that I can do it because of accumulated experience and graft. Mm. Mm. And I, it's very freeing. I, I really encourage, you know, actors are hopeless with this stuff. Whenever I'm around my actor friends, I'm like, that's bollocks. It's you, mate. Yeah. You learnt to do this. No, it's this special pair of undies. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 in all aspects of life, people have a tendency to um, deliberately divest themselves of power over their own fate because it's our, our ang- anxious reaction against the fact that we are tossed in the seas of chaos. Mm. And we, we, in order to try and put some structure around it, we go, well, that's because my star sign said this or because I didn't do this process or because the muse didn't come. That's all language that's just managing our anxiety about the fact that we don't really have control. You wrote Matilda before you had kids around the time that you had yeah, your I first, had a, you my, had a small uh, child. Yeah, and my, um, Casper was my deadline. Your kids are now like 12 and 10, right? Around? Yeah, 13. Yeah, yeah. 13. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to ask you about is your daughter 13 or your son? Yeah, she turned 13 last week. I want to ask you about 13-year-old girls mm. because I've got one as well. And it's so interesting. I've heard someone once say that a, a girl's self-confidence comes from her mother but her self-esteem comes from her father. And Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> in Upright, for example, and it do, maybe it doesn't have to be her father, it might be a male role model in her life. And interestingly, the... The girl in in the movie who plays Meg, like Meg's doesn't have a terrible father, but you become like a father figure on this journey. And it was really interesting to me, this idea of grown men and teenage girls, because teenage girls are terrifying. Like if you've ever got too much self-esteem, you just need to hang out with a teenage girl girl and she will sort you out. Yeah, Millie destroyed me. Yeah. So Millie spent 10 weeks just making me feel like eventually I had to go, Mill, you making me feel bad. She's like, no, no, it's because oh, yeah. I like you. I'm just teasing you. Yeah. yeah. And she's 18. So how did you, you and the script writers all bring that dynamic to life so well? And what have you learnt about teenage girls as being the father of one? They're both big questions. I, I think the fact that Lucky and Meg's relationship feels so profound in a way, back slightly to the um, avoiding the Lolita problem. What's Mm -hmm. interesting about them is it's actually a love story. It's about two people who you just go, well, that's not going to work, who fall in love with each other. Yeah. And you can see it at the end in in episode eight. She, her testimony to his family that really breaks the back of the problem is a, is a love letter in a way, mm. in a very careful, platonic chi- way. Yeah. Um, and his, well, you can just tell how he feels about her. And and I think it feels good because I think we, by accident or design, we gave them both problems that required each other and yet they didn't want to need each other. And so when two characters don't want to need each other but clearly to the audience do need each other and in the end 
save each other or cure each other a bit. It, it feels um, authentic. Writing Lucky is a lot easier than being the father of a 13 year old girl. I mean, Violet's an incredible kid, but the, the change is so fast. Mm -hmm. the, the dawning that I am now an adult, that comes for young women especially, comes with particular markers, um, cultural and physiological markers. Mm. It, it comes so quickly and you, you have to hold your nerve. It's what kids don't understand is we as parents are scared they won't love us. So but you just have to hold your nerve because if you start feeling maybe she doesn't love me, then then you're in trouble because because you start being needy and clinging too hard. I have to virtually just say to myself, I mean, I know Violet adores us, but you wouldn't – sometimes you're like, it doesn't look like it. It's like, remind me? Though. Yeah. Mm. And you just have to spend five years just – assuming the love is still there because mm. you won't get anything. That's what, how I understand it. And I'm a needy mother marker, you know. I'm yeah, I think it can hell. I think mothers can be particularly crushed by their teenage years when their sons yeah. push them away yeah, and I think I fathers I've seen fathers feel the same way yeah. with their daughters and it's it's a it's a biological programming they're meant yeah. to do it. It's yeah. healthy, it's right. Yeah. If it doesn't happen, it's not ideal actually. Yeah. But it still fucking hurts. Yeah, it does. So far we've been okay. You can see glimpses of it getting worse. I think the thing with dads and daughters is Vi and I have something special. Vi and Sarah have something special, but Vi and I have this. It's like a, I mean, she she and I have had, she's achieved intellectual parity with me when she was about eight. I mean, she, she reads books I read faster than I read them. She's not super bright in all directions, but she can. You're she, just really stupid. I'm quite, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all relative. She, I just she, had the reading level of an eight-year-old. What yeah, can I say? She's, she's, she's actually below average in her class. Um, no, she's she's very good with ideas and, and she can, uh, comprehension. She's, mm. she's uh, pretty hopeless at maths. It, it is letting go of the idea that you're you have something sacred because, and and if they come back, you know when they have their babies, you know, watch them crawling back. Um, but yeah, I, also I have, when they need money or a lift. <laughs> yeah, and I started thinking for the first time about being. I haven't really thought about it much. The way I manage um, the F word, the uh, idea that I'm uh, um, famous or um, in the public eye is uh, we just don't talk about it and don't think about it. I don't think about it. I don't. When I meet new people, I don't think they already know who I am. I just forget the whole thing. That's my how I manage it because it's hopeless to second guess what they're thinking about you. That, that, that way madness lies. We don't talk about it in my home and when I get stopped on the streets and the kids are there, you know, when they were young, I'd just say, oh, they know, they like my work. I didn't say, well, they, you know, I just mm. go, oh, they know my work and they like it, whatever. I don't think having a parent in the public eye is good for you. I don't either. I completely agree. I think it's really hard for them to figure out what it means. What it means and also just do they have to be that as well? Yeah. Like it's it yeah. that can be difficult. My and kids are growing up in a world where they think if you're a muso you get to have a nice house and everything's sweet. I'm like, oh no, it's not. It's much, much harder than that. How did the whole family um cope with moving back to Australia because LA is a celebrity town and it's much more used to celebrities. So I guess by LA, you're kind of mid-level famous. Oh no, I'm no one in LA. By Sydney standards, mm. like I read in the paper when you were touring various schools to see which, yeah. where you were going and to put. And they published my house. I yeah, guess. right. Mm. So in Australia, you are, you know, AAA list. So how did everyone adjust to that? I think, Including you. Yeah, I think it was a tough element of a very tough time. We we found the move. This move was one move too many. I mean, we had to do it because we had to come home and we certainly weren't going to stay in LA. But we that move just battered us, partly because of what I'd been through with the movie and stuff and we were just feeling a bit battered. But Sarah, who's, you know, rock solid, bulletproof chick, and you've um, been together since uni. Yeah, since uni. She she really, we had a tough first six months. The kids found it hard. But what was particularly hard for Sarah and I, we were trying to smile through for the kids and we just, we just, I don't know, we found it really 
hard. And still, two years in, I've, I've got my sisters, um, but it's actually not family you need. Family's just there and they need you as much as you need them and it's a sort of exchange of we love each other very much. Uh, but what you need is a gang, you know, someone to have a gin with when some you know, talk about your teenage daughters with. You need your kids to have friends where you know their parents and a uh, soccer club and, you know, and starting again in your early 40s in the eastern suburbs of Sydney where the school they're like drop your kids off there's no community at all it's uh, which was a real pity actually um it's and then on top of that oh my god everyone here knows who I am and have everyone on the street has an assumption oh that guy with the eye makeup's moving in and they've all got me completely wrong what because, do they think of you well you're not wearing eye makeup today at uh, the record show i i mean I, of course I, I i mean you know me I, i'm a nerdy I'm a nerd. I'm a massive nerd, you know. I'm a bookish composer. But also uh, rock star. Well, I, I, um, that's the bit that I don't think about much but I realise other people do because when you're on stage and there's thousands of people there, you're just the person on stage getting through your work. If I ever go see, uh, like I go see Ben Folds or something, I go, oh, my God, that's what I do. It really freaks me out. So it's like a not a persona, but it's like you do what you do on the stage, but you're not always that. Yeah. Because, I mean, some performers are, you know, very alpha, yeah. very yeah. out there. And the, the other thing is I take no drugs and I, I, I have no affairs and I, you know. That's I, I'm, your problem. I'm deeply, I know, I'm <laughs> deeply uh, conservative. You're a terrible lifestyle. rock star. I'm a shit rock star and um, and I need to get on with it. But, um, you know, moving into the eastern suburbs of Sydney near the beach, of course most of the people on your street are in their 50s and 60s having done their thing and bought their house near the ocean. And I love all my neighbours and Sarah and I have one policy which is you get along with everyone and Sarah's an amazing at connecting with people and with there's, you know, our neighbours can all have their little tiffs. We are benevolence personified because we we like people we're, we're what's the opposite of misanthropist oh, uh, pro-anthropist I don't well, know. It's, anthropist uh, it's uh it's actually philanthropist but oh. that's not how we use it anyway <laughs> um do you know and uh, ando was the um was the clincher because all my neighbors watch that and one of my neighbors after we've been living there for when 18, he did his 18 show and months he painted you. yeah after 18 months uh, our neighbor ros went i watched ando you're quite bright aren't you and i'm like <laughs> Well, I'm not sure about that, but I did. I did compose. I, I mean, who do you think I am? <laughs> what, what do you mean? Why are you so surprised? Anyway, yeah, I think uh, it's really. So you important. haven't found your gang yet. We have some really good friends uh, down mm. the street. Um, a few people around. Uh, I think. I think it's all right. I think finding a new gang in your forties is a bit hard. Of a, you know, mm. I'm not sure you. And I've got my active friends. And I've got my cafe I go to and my gym I go to and it's it's actually really, really good now. But I was going to ask about me. Sarah in terms of being the trailing spouse because that's mm. tough. That's that's never easy. Um, and then the one who has to carry a lot of the mental load, I imagine, of making sure the kids are in school and everyone's got their networks. Well, and she's the one who bought the house in Sydney, sold the house in LA, packed I do no, I do nothing. As in I do, uh, I empty the dishwasher and take the kids to school and I, on day to day I'm when I'm around I'm um, a contributor. But you don't do life admin. I don't do life admin. She does she runs the the game. She runs the whole thing. And the whole thing's quite complicated. And she was a social worker and was very relieved to be able to stop. It was a hell of a surprise mm. that just when we had Violet my career took off, so it was a incredible. It was like someone had gone, here's all your problems solved. The cost being I was away and mm -hmm. touring. And, but you say, Sarah, it was like she was designed to go through this. She, um, some, some people get uh, quite seduced by the openings and mm. it's that they, the, 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 as the spouse of a person who they becomes there, she just, she'll come. I was going to say, is it hard work for her? Because it's not her industry. They're not her friends. Like, She's pretty good I would at find her. that quite. It's like going to your partner's work party. Yeah, totally. It's, it, that's a that's hard work. She she's pretty good at it, and and it's interesting as Sarah's got a bit older, she's got a reputation amongst friends and people who know us obliquely um, as being a rock solid, awesome chick, and she's earned that by just wait. She just waits for people to come to her. You know, she's mm -hmm. not an extrovert. She's not uh, sparkle arkle. She's she um, 
She can be, uh, when, when you meet her, she, depending on her mood, she might not read very, she might read a bit cool. And she's not, but she, she's just got that resting cool thing. And the people, are, I think she feels quite strong now. I think she's past the sort, she, she's not competitive. She is beautifully heartwarmingly and refreshingly uncompetitive mm. uh, un- unambitious actually does she get jealous no that's what's incredible about mm. her she knows who she is and and she she i mean when she, we moved to sydney she got as sad as i've ever seen her and questioning of every now and then goes oh i'm just in, i'm just serving your bottomless need to achieve more crap i'm just your facilitator so that you can have your, all your dreams come true and kids you don't have to look after. Uh, that That's her at hitting bottom. And, you know, a month after she sort of said that to me when we moved to Sydney, I went, we need to talk about that feeling. And she went, oh, it's just, I was just <laughs> feeling down. down. You know, but she, she writes beautiful short stories and, you know, it's, yeah. she sort of wants to get them published, but not. I think it would be amazing for her. but Not why she, she writes them. Probably not. And I really want to encourage her and push her. I, I push her a lot. I've dragged her around the world. I go, come on, we're going to learn to ski and let's go ocean swimming. And, and she's a much less that person. And I have to, and I've had to say to her, it's your life. I will do anything, barring stopping working, to support you. We, we've got ourselves in a position where you can do what you want to do. We're not, you know, we're not. If we need more help, we can get more help. And I can't push you because it's your, it's yours, it's your life. But that's easy to say, but she's a mum and she's a primary carer yeah. and she's got a husband who's obsessive about work. So it's all very well to say you can get more help, but she's like, yeah, but I don't want someone else to bring up my kids. Yeah, that's exactly I want right. you, you to be here. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, well, I, I, I'm going to make a TV show now. How do you stay on the same page with someone over... Uh, you guys have been married for 18 years, but you've been together longer than that. Yeah, 20, well, 1993, 26 years. Yeah. I've been with my husband for around that long, Um, but we split up for a couple of years. Yeah, so did we. So you did as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was when I went out with your husband and you were out with Sarah. (laughs) Good times. Are we like exactly the same age as well, aren't we? I think so. Mm. I think so. Um, Was that the recalibration for you? How old were your kids when that happened? Oh, or no, was we it broke you up had when we were young. We worked together okay. for three years and then we – oh, so you broke up. We you, got married, then broke oh, up after we had one child and then got back together and oh, then had two more children. That's a much more profound move. So did you – and, you know, there are ups and downs and, and I'm – so many of my friends are divorced. I'm sure you're the same. Mm-hmm. Like we're fairly unusual cats, you and I, being yeah. being married for as long as in we have been. In this industry as well. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you how you guys stay on the same page but through so many different iterations, through you being struggling, through you being wildly famous, through you having dis- career disappointment, through moving to different places, through her becoming a mother and the children getting older. So many different iterations of you as individuals. How have you taking care of you two as a couple? Well, it's mostly just that she's an extraordinary person. And by extraordinary, I mean unordinary, like not normal. She's not extraordinary as in she's just a great person. And For she's you. unusual. Yeah, unusual. Like you, in, you both obviously yeah. complement each we other complement really well because so many people say we different. just grow apart yeah. and whatever and growing apart is actually probably yeah. more normal than staying together in many ways. Yeah, well, it's, it's through our journey. I mean, I, I, as I say, I'm quite conservative and come from a big, very close family and so I am and Sarah's the same. We both have parents who are still together and we have both decided but I guess uh, it's for me having gone through this transition from being someone just a sort of pudgy ginger kid that no one's interested in to someone who a lot of people are interested in, I, I've made a, a choice that I think um, Sarah's the right person and that monogamy is the right idea and that family is a priority over all the other stuff which I also really, 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 really want. A lot. I've written songs. I, in my recent tour, I've got a song called I'll Take Lonely Tonight, which is about 
resisting temptation, which is the song that actually resonates with audiences at the most these days. But I, I've made a choice, and it, it, it's a it's a real commitment to loyalty. Which so that's what I've done. But mostly, it's just that Sarah is uh, infinitely tolerant, and to be fair. We were a couple of kids from Perth. I was playing in cover bands and bringing home whatever, 15 grand I think I, I earned in 2004. And she was a social worker. And in a period of three years, we suddenly, well, by the time Matilda was done, we realised we probably would never have a financial woe in our lives and that we could live the life we wanted to live. Mm. So it's pretty, you'd have to be a bit of a, dick to whine too much we are hugely aware of how lucky we are i think that's very important she is uncompetitive and not jealous i think that's hugely important and i don't take the piss so mm. i work very hard but i'm not like oh darling i'm home going out with my mates i i don't i don't go out with people i don't go to openings i don't i don't um take drugs and stay up all night i i don't when i'm home it's just she and i doing our thing we 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 just we we both like exercise <laughs> i mean you know we we're, we're boring you've got to also keep choosing to be together i think that's the thing you yeah. said i've made a choice you don't just make that choice once i right. reckon you keep you every night you make when you're on yeah. the road yeah not every night but i imagine you have to make that choice often as well, does she it, it stopped being a problem at some point for some reason i got to a point where i no longer had the opportunity. I, yeah, the, the opportunities have gone away because um, of how I structure mm. stuff. Yeah, I think the choice is, uh, it's like a choice to be healthy. It's like a choice to uh, eat well or to exercise. You have to mm. every day make the choice make again. Make the bloody choice again, you know. But Sarah, ah, just I'm, I'm really fond of her and, and we really are totally different cats, like in every way. Did money cause problems when you got it, because again, Liz Gilbert having this out of nowhere, oh, yeah. this massive windfall. And she said it caused a lot of problems in some of her relationships because she did things like she gave a lot of friends a lot of money. And that actually ironically caused some yeah, problems in some of those relationships. What have you learned about suddenly having money when you didn't before? It comes with a huge amount of guilt, which I, um, at the risk of sounding um, pious, I find I have a really difficult relationship. Uh, you know, we don't have, you know, we have secondhand cars and send our kids to a school you pay for and we, we, we have a house near the beach, but we're not, we don't buy You're stuff. not wearing we gold robes. We don't. I don't think I'm wearing anything uh, under five years old, but I, I, I don't, um, we're not, we weren't very interested in money when we were poor and we're not particularly, we're just not very interested in it. So we manage our guilt by by paying African tax every dollar of it and not avoiding it because that's what psychopathic assholes do. Um, and we give stuff and then we have people in our family who need help. And you've got to be very, very careful of that because you change your power dynamic. It's it's one yeah, thing getting famous never that already that. changes the power dynamic. But I will not my, – my big brother is is my big brother. He's my big brother. I, I, I'm not – he's um, – He's higher status than me. He's my big brother. I look up to him. He's, I, I, I'm not going to give him money and make it the relationship be about me being not, – not that, not that he accepted or needs it, but you know what I mean. You do, yeah, you don't it does do, change that power yeah, balance. I hadn't I thought of to, that. I want to. I want to just go, oh, they, 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 they're struggling this year to do it. I'll just do it. And, and there are ways you can go, oh, come and see us. We really want we'll, – we'll do the flights because we, this is, we need you there. You know, there are mm -hmm. lots of ways to do it. But, but you my, have to be my, sensitive. But my family – you know, obviously my family are hardworking, excellent people. They, they don't want my stinking money and I, I, I don't have bottomless money anyway, but uh, you do spend a lot of time battling with how do I make sure I'm doing the right thing with this stuff. Well, Upright is an extraordinary triumph. What's next? Oh, good. Um, I'm putting out an album next year, which of, of some of my new curious but not punchliney songs. And then I, I don't know how much I can suggest it, but obviously in the weeks since Upright's come out, the reaction has been so such second that, season. that there'll be, one suspects there'll be significant pressure to go again. And it, What lovely pressure to have. Yeah. 
But you, as you know, it really wraps up. Yes and no. But you want to spend, you want to see what happens. I want to spend so. more time with them. Yeah. I really do. I'm really invested. I want to spend more time okay. with them. Well, Can I'll you organise that? In, I'll take that into account. I'd really um, appreciate it. Thanks. And uh, I'm touring again. You have to come this time. I'm touring in March. I'm just doing the show I did last year, just an encore sort of round the, the country. And uh, and, and I'm, I'm starting work on a new musical as well. Thanks, Tim. Congrats. Thanks. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that. I sure did. You can watch the whole first season of Upright on Foxtel anytime. Next week on No Filter, I speak to Ellie Cole. She's a triple Paralympian who has 15 Paralympic medals to her name, including six gold, four silver and five bronze. It's such a fun interview. We laughed all the way through it. Clearly, with all those medals, she and I have so much in common. Uh, Ellie has a really interesting story. She actually lost her leg to cancer when she was just three years old and she's been on the Australian Paralympic swim team for more than half her life. Don't miss No Filter next week. And in the meantime, if you want something else to listen to, Titus for Titus, our podcast about Indigenous female excellence, is back for season two. Titta means sister. And in this podcast series, Marley Silver, who is the host and founder of Titus for Titus and a proud Gamilaroi and Dungadi woman, brings to life stories from the country's deadliest Indigenous sisters. Episodes one and two are out now. And to kick off the season, Marley spoke with her own sister, Keely, about January 26th and what the date means to them as young Indigenous women. It's such an interesting conversation to listen to. And in the most recent episode, we are introduced to Indigenous journalist Shani Wellington, who is keeping politicians accountable and giving a voice to those who may not get heard. To listen, you can follow the link in our show notes or search Titus for Titus in your favourite podcast app, including Spotify. No Filter is produced by Bridget Northeast. I'm Mia Friedman and I'll see you on Mamma Mia.